My name is Michael Staudinger. I'm a meteorologist and I work for the Austrian Met Service, which is one of the oldest Met Services in the world, but faced with the latest problem, not the only one. What did we do? It was about 10 years ago, we set up together with 17 other European Met Services, a warning system with the demand to have it standardized across Europe and to reach out to the people, to let it grow. Now, in these 10 years of standardization, of homogenization of the, of the warnings, we learned quite a lot. And it's 10 questions we were asking ourselves, and which I would also like to ask you, when it comes to getting the message across, getting a warning across. Now, this is the system, what it looks like. And you see the map of Europe, and you see down here, the parameters we are warning for, and you see the color codes, the levels of the warnings. No? I'm sorry for that. No? It's four levels. And what we wanted to achieve is if there's the level red, the highest level, that people would really react. Because many of us beforehand had warning systems which had a yes-no system. There was a warning, and whether it was 60 kilometers of wind speed, which is some wind, but not dangerous, not really dangerous, or 150 kilometers an hour, there was no difference. No? So with these four levels, we could separate one of these four levels for really extreme situations. And we defined the warning in a way that it's not related only to the thresholds in terms of meteorology or hydrology, but it's coined and it's calibrated towards the direction of the people. So this means it's calibrated towards a possible potential damage, and from there, the frequency how often these warnings levels should be used, and from there to meteorology. So the thresholds for meteorology, they change very much over Europe, but the expected behavior of the people doesn't change at all. Red means that you should be prepared for extraordinary measures, that you have to leave your house, which you haven't, last, you haven't been evacuated for the last 30 years. To make people react in these situations is a tricky task. And while we develop this, we, we're asking ourselves quite a few questions, and I'd like to share them with you, and I'd be very interested to know your opinion right away. What's in a name? You know this from, where do you know this from? Rome and Julia? She says, Julia says it, no. What's in a name, the Montaga? What's a warning? That was our question, no? What's a definition? And what's the first point where you would look for a definition about a warning? As it says here, no? It's in your constitution, it's in your law for civil protection, it's in the law for the med service, wherever it is for communication. No? And it says, a warning is when the authority says, this is a warning. Now, my question to you, is this the whole story? Sure not. And that's what we learned the hard way, because we were sticking, we're all bureaucrats, now we're sticking to the definition, looking back what's in our law, and see, What's, how is the warning defined in a different countries, in different legislation, different constitutions? Huh? Now, that's what the warning is. It's defined by the users. If a user understands a damage scenario, if a user says, yes, I got the message, and secondly, and this is even more important, if the user gets a clear advice what to do, he would define the warning much more through the advice which he gets which means leave the house, or it's for rare situations, or be careful if you climb on a mountain, which means if you expose yourself in a yellow situation, no? you have to expose yourself to get really into risk. This is how the user sees a warning. And this definition from the user's point of view is at least as important than the one we had from the legal point of view. What you have to do is to combine the two and to be aware of the two dimensions of the problem. Now, the aim of warnings, what's the aim of a warning? It's immediate reaction. That's what you would say on, on first sight, not what you want. But if you think a little bit farther, you want a little bit more. So what would you like to have in the long run? If you think about the disaster risk cycle, people changing their behavior. And this means that every warning which you give and every warning which is well done it's part of preparedness. It's part of the learning curve. It's part of a correct response that people know with each yellow, with some damages somewhere, with each 
orange or amber no? with quite a few damages all over the country but this not being red people learn that if there's a red color it must be something definitely more serious and this changes in the long run the behavior of the people if you just have two categories saying yes or no warning yes or no you never have this learning curve so this is for us was one of the most important part get the training from the actual warning situation to a more general learning which scenarios are possible in my region which are possibly my country <clears throat> now you see the picture from the chain and quite often <clears throat> in some languages the the term chain of command or chain of information is used how do you how much do you like it sounds good somehow yes or no what's your what's your guess is it too optimistic it's as strong as the weakest link that's a very good point point. and what else any more ideas about that it's strong it can be pretty fine yes but is it the whole story I mean it's one directional and it should be yeah there should be loops in it and exactly exactly uh, what we would come closer to in our analysis of the situation how people come how communication really works from the very source of the communication of the, the the chain of information if you want to the receiver it's more flow and what's the what's the nice picture there from the Alps from the flow it just runs and it increases and gets bigger and bigger no? and the water that's at the very beginning of the river ends up in the in the Black Sea in Europe in the Danube for example now but what's the other problem as you said beforehand the, the weakest link uh, this is the other part this is from the Aral Sea of the flow there's as if you know about metrology you know about evaporation and the same happens with information it's easily lost so to be aware of the, the, the fact that information is always much closer to a flow which can dissipate which can evaporate it comes closer to reality because too often information gets lost when you think it's a chain it's very strong it might be as the uh, weakest link but information is prone to get lost on the way now another question is how much information do we need now the single of uh, authoritative voice it's a big uh, uh, principle in, in WMO for example huh? the metro is the authorities and the media we put a little bit a drop of oil in between these wheels and it works perfectly now, now what's the information landscape today if you open your smartphone or your laptop and go to your mailbox it's more like this we are in the middle of a very complicated network and everybody gets information from all directions all the time now what's the job of the information provider to make sure that there's strong flows of information which people trust how do you get the trust you have to earn it the hard way with good quality with also possible false alarm rate but it doesn't have to, it, it's not it can't be too high but you have to earn the trust with each warning you give and which each warning you didn't give so to be aware of this and also to be aware of uh, a complicated information landscape extremely important now who's afraid of civil protection it's a very provocative question to ask here at the ISDR meeting no? if you and this is what we experience in Europe in many of the of the countries med services info providers quite often you see a bit of tension you see a bit of fear of discussing things openly you see discussions who should issue a warning for us we've seen it's extremely important that whoever can improve the relationship between the info provider might be hydro service med service uh, geophysical service and civil protection it's the most important job which you have to do in this in this context so uh, how good does a med service last question now we finish in a second does the med service have to be to be credible is it a question of money sure it's and and if you're responsible for a med service then you always talk about money but if you're responsible towards the, the users of the information it's much more than that it's user orientation and this is a shift of paradigm that quite a few of the partners we had in the major alarm group made in the last couple of years now money of course it's needed is one part of the story but to have a really 
user-orientated service you know, that listens to the users, that provides the information in the right way, that updates the, the methods of information with the latest techniques, but also makes sure that people are reached in every possible way. And it's, oh, sometimes it's not just a technical way to see it, Sometimes it's just if there's no cell phones in a little village in a not so developed country, that someone goes with a bicycle to the village, has a megaphone and tells, listen, the river is coming, get out of the house, evacuate. No? So see these possibilities as well. Typically users, hard to reach. Are you aware of them? Many times not. Why not? Many times you say it's a technical question. As I said beforehand, people not having smartphones. Many times it's people you are not aware of because they are not participating in the political process, in the process of decision making. And look at this young fellow, he comes from Sweden, goes skiing in Austria. How much does he know about the warning system? Not very much. That's why having a harmonized system where you can tell him, listen, this is red, and red meaning the same in Sweden than in Austria and other parts of the world, is extremely important. So, which false alarm rate is still okay? 10%, would that be fine? I would say, it can be more, and it's to achieve a warning system with only 10% of false alarm rate, that'd be fantastic. We might be as far as this in the next 15, 20, 30 years. What you need is a good communication, and a good communication includes also probabilities, that you say there's a high probability that your village, at this point, this island is hit by the typhoon. It might pass by 100 kilometers north and there's no damage at all, but you keep people informed about the probabilities then you could count it if it passes by 100 kilometers away. You could count it as a false alarm. But if you frame it the right way, people would know, okay, three days ago we knew it was close by, now we know it's 100 kilometers north. And they would interpret it as a correct warning. Meet alarm system global, which WM was planning and it will be presented this, this morning by Petri Talas. It's difficult to set up. But, and I already gave the answer now, the investments per year on meteorological infrastructure is three billion. So using this information, satellites, ground stations, radio sounds, using this information, get the message across, saving lives over the globe, it's less than 0.01%. So it really makes sense. And that's I would recommend it's in the, in the room A at 11.30, the WMO presentation. What's the value of standardization, interoperability, and to reach out? Mostly, the value is, for me, from my point of view, to overcome the inertia of institutions. No? And we've seen it in many occasions that institutions have their own psychology, often like little children. So working together, and this is why the meeting here is so important, getting to know the partners from other institutions is extremely important. Thank you very much.